This is the story of Cassius Clay, who shocked the world and became heavyweight champion. If Joe Frazier whoops me, I'm getting on my hands on my knees, I'm crawl across the ring, look up to you, say you The first fight of Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, one of the most publicized fights in history. So a man like George that comes out with those big... A look at Muhammad Ali recapturing the crown with a stunning upset of George Foreman. And I wrote a sharp poem. It says it will be a killer and a thriller and a killer when I get the gorilla in Manila. It was one of the greatest fights in history as Ali beat Frazier in the thriller in Manila. Three years later, at the age of 36, Ali defeated Leon Spinks to become the first man to win the heavyweight title three times. But finally, the last hurrah for the aging Ali as Larry Holmes battered his hero into submission. This is the story of one of boxing's best, Muhammad Ali. HBO Sports presents Boxing's Best. The story of Muhammad Ali. And now from Louisville, Kentucky, here is your host, Barry Tompkins. For the next 60 minutes, we're going to be talking about a fighter. A fighter who grew up on those streets right out there. Not just any fighter, mind you, but the self-proclaimed and maybe in fact, greatest heavyweight of them all. But the story started when an 89-pound, 12-year-old kid walked into a gym run by Joe Martin and told a story about somebody stealing his bicycle and what he wanted to do and what he wanted to get out of life was to beat that kid up. Joe, tell us that story. Well, that's, that's the story. He had his bicycle stolen. Uh, we were trained, uh, or I did, trained amateur boxers at the Columbia Gym, which is now Spalding College in the basement. And each year the local merchants would put on a three or four day show to display their wares. And of course they had candy and balloons and one thing or another to give the youngsters who came down for the show and, of course, he come to get his goodies on his bicycle, and while he was there, somebody took his bike. And, uh, of course, he was very upset about that and uh, wanted to report it to the police. And as I was a police officer, why well, someone told him, well, there's a police officer downstairs in the gymnasium. Go down and tell him about it. So he did come down there, and he was having a fit and uh, about half crying because someone had stole his bike. He was only 12 years old then. And uh, so uh, he was going to whip whoever he found him. So I brought up the subject. I said, well, you better learn how to fight before you start challenging people that you're going to whip. The first moment in the sun for Cassius Clay came in the 1960 Olympic Games at Rome. But interesting, Joe, he almost didn't make that trip. That's true. He was afraid of flying. We had a rough flight going to California for the Olympic trials. And uh, so when it come time to go to Rome, uh, he said he wasn't going to fly and that he wouldn't go to Rome. And I said, well, you'd uh, lose your opportunity being a, a great fighter. And he said, well, I, I'm not going to go. And he wanted to take a boat or something. But anyway, I finally took him out to Central Park here in Louisville, and uh, we had a long talk for a couple, three hours. And I finally conned him in and convinced him that if he wanted to be heavyweight champion in the world, that he had to go to Rome and win the Olympics. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Now he not only can take the boat, he can own the boat. Let's go back now to Rome, 1960, the Olympic Games. The 17th Olympiad in Rome, Italy in the summer of 1960. A brash 178-pound Cassius Clay accepted the gold medal in the Palazzo dello Sport after defeating Bekas of Belgium, Shatov of the Soviet Union, and Argentina's Tony Madigan. Cassius destroyed Pietraszkowski of Poland in the finals. His vocal antics out of the ring and his flamboyant style in the ring made the native of Louisville an instant celebrity as he returned to a parade held in his honor. Later, someone tried to take the gold medal from Cassius and he ended up fighting the man off. This act became so disturbing to the Olympic champion that he decided to throw the medal into the Ohio River, standing on the Jefferson County Bridge in Louisville. For some unknown reason, he claimed he gained new strength from this confusing act. A pro career was soon to follow. October 29, 1960, the pro debut of Cassius Clay. 
he had signed a six-year deal with 10 Louisville millionaires who would receive 50% of Clay's earnings. Tunney Hunsaker would become the first victim of the most charismatic athlete in the history of sports. Weighing only 182 pounds, light for a heavyweight, all Louisville boxing fans turned out to see their young Olympic gold medal winner. He did not disappoint anyone. Supremely confident, young Clay boxed smartly, easily winning his professional debut with a flashy, unanimous decision. After the fight, the search began for a trainer. Archie Moore was chosen over Angelo Dundee, but Cassius soon soured on Moore's over-disciplined training habits, and he was released. At 18, Cassius Clay pondered his future. They think that I am becoming overconfident, but I will never be so overconfident until it would interfere with my training program. I'm gunning for Floyd Patterson and Sonny Liston. If they get in my way, I will annihilate them also. Uh, I'm only bold and cocky before and after fight. Let me see you close your mouth and just keep it closed. Well, you know that's impossible. No, 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 keep it closed. You know that's impossible. I'm the greatest. And I'm knocking out all bones. And if you get too small, I'll knock you out. Now close your mouth, but just let me see you keep it closed for 10 seconds. Well, that's impossible. You know that's impossible. Well, yes, I would love to break Floyd Patterson's record. As you know, today is the jet age. Everybody's trying to break records. Man says that he'll be on the moon by 1970. One man said that uh, they're going to make cars that run by sunlight. Well, those are pretty game predictions. Well, I predicted I'd be the heavyweight champion by the time I'm 21. Ironically, on November 15, 1962, Cassius Clay took on his former trainer. Archie Moore was now 48 years old. The outspoken 20-year-old predicted a fourth-round knockout in this, his 16th professional fight. The former light heavyweight champion had fought an astonishing 227 fights as he confronted a determined Cassius Clay. Sharp, stinging punches by Cassius Clay. Clay looking for that open. Moore pressing forward, trying to get in that one big punch to take Clay out of there. Ripping punches by Clay and Moore goes down. Cassius raises his hands over his head. Courageously, Archie gets to his feet. Moore is sent to the canvas again by a barrage of punches. For the second time, Archie gets to his feet to face the inevitable. Ripping punches by Cassius Clay, and it's all over. After Clay fulfilled his prophecy of knocking out Moore in four, he started crusading around the country, preaching for a shot at Sonny Liston's title. Cassius Clay became a candidate on the campaign trail for the heavyweight championship of the world. Freedom Hall here in Louisville, Kentucky. This was the scene of a very green Cassius Clay winning a six-round decision from a trivia question named Tunney Hunsacker. At that time, he didn't have a trainer. He didn't have a friend like Angela Dundee either. Angie, I think it's interesting that your relationship with Muhammad Ali really started again with Muhammad Ali's mouth. Well, actually, Muhammad Ali's mouth is the thing that created everything. Uh, when Muhammad Ali's mouth went, nothing else went. I met him here in Louisville, 1958. I was here with uh, Willie Pastrano, and uh, great experience, and we've been talking ever since. Angie, every fighter has a pivotal point in his career. After you beat Archie Moore, you went to England, you fought a pretty good heavyweight named Henry Cooper, and he knocked your man down in the fourth round. Now, uh, the word has it that Muhammad Ali was out on his feet when he got back to the corner, and then there was an incident with an alleged cut glove, and you were supposedly responsible for that. What really happened? Well, actually, I can't take all the credit of that. The glove did split early on. And what I did, I helped it a little bit and pulled it to the side and made the 
uh, commissioner wear it as a split glove. And then it got me a little time, buy it a little time, and uh, Muhammad wound up knocking the guy out in the fifth round. Then there was a chance at the championship, and Muhammad Ali bought a bus and put a sign on the side of it that, in his words, said, Liston is great, but he'll fall in eight. But while there were the fun and games, there was also the serious side of Muhammad Ali at that point. It was when he started to embrace the Muslim faith, and that, in fact, threatened the fight itself. Well, McDonald didn't know how to contend with the Muslim religion. He didn't know, actually, what I don't think of what it was, but it was getting some adverse publicity. So what happened, he threatened to call off the fight. Well, Muhammad wouldn't renounce the religion, then he recanted, the fight went on, won the title, and the rest is history. A history that took a giant step in Miami Beach when it was an eight to one underdog named Muhammad Ali who took on the bear, Sonny Liston. February 25th, 1964, Cassius Clay boasted that Sonny Liston would fall in eight. The challenger was hysterical at the weigh-in, and doctors recorded Clay's pulse at double his normal rate. Amidst a rash of death threats because of his association with Muslims, Clay set out to claim the heavyweight championship. Man, I don't get hit. I'm the fastest thing on two feet, man. Are you crazy? I'm tired of right, talking. Listen, the champion just made an offer. $100 around the spar with him. And you can only, and you can get in shape besides. Well, I'll make a better offer than that. I don't fight the champ for nothing. Cassius, how do you feel with it? Pretty good. How you doing? I hear you're mad. Sonny Liston. Yeah, how was he? Yeah. Wasn't too friendly. What do you have to say? He didn't even shake my hand. What are you going to do about that? Now you must fall. I don't care how small the ring is. I'll fight that chump in a telephone booth. If he wants me, you tell this to your camera, your TV man, your radio man, and you right there in the whole world. If Sonny Lister looks me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. I'm not out of the rain on my knees. Tell him he's the greatest and catch the next jet out of the country. That's what I think about Sonny Lister. I think he should be locked up uh, in person in the fight. The 8 to 1 underdog takes the offensive. to hear the bell, they fight eight and a half seconds after the end of the round. Ladies and gentlemen, we're looking in with our overhead camera into the corner of Cassius Clay, who is still doing the talking. He's still, he's breathing a bit hard. Barney Felix, the referee, did not stop that round when that bell sounded. Perhaps the referee didn't hear it. Champion Joe Lewis. Going, look at the guy yawning. Tell us what you think at the end of one. Well, Steve, I think this was the greatest round of any, of any fight we've seen in a long time. Instructed in his corner to take the lead, Clay now sets the pace. That left hook is Clay's best punch up to this point. After Clay backs Liston to the ropes, he verbally challenges the champion, sets him up for the left-right combination that opens a cut under Liston's eye. Liston puts on the pressure now, trying to land that one big punch. At 
the end of this round, Liston's corner will call the doctor to the ring and over the champion's protest, stop the fight. Now they're working, as we know, with our camera shots in there below the left eye. They've already worked below the right eye. There you see them. Joe Polino trying to keep that cut closed. They might be stopping it. That might be all, ladies and gentlemen. Get up there, Joe. Get up there. Get up in the ring. A new era in the heavyweight division was born. A brash young man with a mouth as big as his fists had become the heavyweight champion of the world. After he won the crown, he would be recognized as Muhammad Ali, a Muslim in the nation of Islam. Although the press still called him Cassius Clay, Ali felt that this was a name given by slave owners, an unworthy name for a heavyweight champion. He was proud of his race, religion, and most of all, this historic accomplishment. May 25th, 1965, Ali trained for the rematch amidst rumors of an assassination. Malcolm X had been gunned down in New York and the champion feared he was next. Before the fight, police searched for concealed weapons. Ironically, fight fans are still searching for Ali's invincible punch. Keep an eye on Clay's lightning fast right hand. A short, choosing right to the jaw, and Liston goes down. The champion refuses to go to the neutral corner, and referee Joe Walcott tries to push Clay away. Liston still hasn't heard a number and doesn't have the slightest idea what the count is. Liston arises at the count of 14, and Walcott wipes his glove. Jersey Joe is still looking over at the official timer. The fight continues when Walcott leaves. Muhammad Ali claimed there was no fix. Nonetheless, the boxing world still questions Liston's reactions to a right hand administered by a retreating Ali. It remains as a seat of controversy and a black mark on Ali's outstanding record. November 14, 1966, Muhammad Ali took on Cleveland Williams. 46 foreign countries in 125 locations in the U.S. were hooked up to closed circuit. When Ali fought, the world stopped. Williams keeps chasing Ali, but is stopped in his tracks by a one-two combination. The challenger hits the canvas for the first knockdown. As the mandatory eight-count rule is in effect, referee Harry Kessler counts the required eight seconds, but Williams is up with a count of three. Williams returns to the fray, only to be met with an avalanche of leather. The challenger goes down again. Williams, who owns one of the most amazing KO records in the modern Again, rises from the canvas after only a few seconds against the benefit of a full eight count. As the champion moves in again, Williams launches one of his lethal left hooks but misses the agile Ali. After the knockout of Williams, it was clear that Ali was in his prime. But the Louisville draft board had changed his draft status from 1Y to 1A. Muhammad responded that he had no quarrel with the Viet Cong. Americans were furious. March 22, 1967. Muhammad Ali uttered the words, this may be your last chance to see me in living color. The heavyweight champion stated he would take the jail sentence over military service. Zora Foley was a 34-year-old soft-spoken contender. He would become Ali's 29th consecutive victim and the last man in the 60s to challenge for Ali's title. 
Holly could end it any time he chooses. Holly boxing confidently, piling up the point. Looking for his spot. A sharp right and Foley goes down. Ali backs off to a neutral corner. It's all over. After Muhammad Ali knocked out Foley, he was stripped of his boxing license by every state commission in the United States. Because his conscientious objection to military service was turned down, the boxing world was deprived of watching one of the greatest heavyweight champions in history for three and a half years. After that fight with Zora Foley, most of the battles Muhammad Ali fought were in places like this, the courthouse here in Louisville, Kentucky. It started 43 months of inactivity, and every state revoked the champion's boxing license. And Angelo, I think you really have to consider, even though it's hypothetical, those might have been the best 43 months of the champion's career. Well, I don't know about the best. He suffered because he wasn't fighting. But during all that time, he never had no animosity towards anyone, never got mad at anybody. In fact, he would call me up at time and say, hey, Ange, how about coming out and working out at the gym? Will you let me work out? I said, stop that. This is your gym. Anytime you want to. And uh, I loved him for that because he never said one adverse thing about against anybody. During that period of time, there were a lot of chances to get a fight for Muhammad Ali and a lot of people with a lot of ideas, but nothing ever came of it. I know they tried several spots, several towns, several states, several gimmicks, doing it indoors, out of a, a suburban area. It never worked. Uh, he would have loved to fought, naturally, because that's what he loved was boxing. You have to think that were that situation to happen today, it might have been a very different story. Muhammad Ali might have been a victim of the times. Well, at the end of it, everybody gave him accolades for what he'd done, for believing what he'd done. I mean, because he was sincere, he was honest. I always said, heck, I hope I was as great a Catholic as he was a Muslim. So the champion of the people was the prisoner of the people for three years and eight months. He came up a loser until he got to the Supreme Court, where he scored a unanimous decision. Muhammad Ali was in a battle with the courts and millions of Americans who doubted his appeal for conscientious objector status. The champion had failed his draft test twice before, but skeptical officers kept after the evasive Ali. Muhammad received many death threats and a disturbing telegram from ex-champion Gene Tunney which read, You have disgraced your title, the American flag, and the principles for which it stands. Now, draft is another thing that's against my religious beliefs. When a registrant refuses this first step, when his name is called, he is quietly removed from the room. He is counseled as to the seriousness of his refusal. He is given the penalties, the maximum legal penalties that this act could uh, result in. Whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun fire that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. If he again refuses, we ask him if he would give a statement that he refuses induction. I said that I'm going to be a man, I'm going to fight it legally. If I lose it, I'm just going to jail. As many of you know, these days I'm not boxing. So uh, I accept these college invitations to come out to meet uh, many of you. I realize that in these country towns like this, you never get a chance to see the world, world town. Can my title be taken without me being whooped? No! One more time. No! That's all, all I can do. <laughs> now, I would like to hear this from you. I would like to hear this from you. And I want the world and the cameras to hear. Who's the heavyweight champion of the world? One more time, we don't want no excuses. They may say the film was bad or the camera was broke. One more time, who's the champ of the world? On February 3rd, 1970, Ali announced his retirement, 
But then State Senator Leroy Johnson orchestrated a comeback fight with Jerry Quarry on October 26th in Atlanta. The king of the world scored a third round knockout. Muhammad Ali was back. December 7th, 1970. Oscar Bonavena becomes the final tune-up in Ali's quest for a shot at Joe Frazier's title. The Argentinian decided to belittle Ali at the weigh-in. Oscar learned that no one could beat Ali at his own game. Why you no go to the army? I will tell you Monday night in the first clinch. Ah, chicken, you chicken. Okay. Beep, 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 chicken, beep, 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 chicken, beep. Good deal. Go Keep there. talking. Chicken. Keep, Keep chicken. talking. Stop now getting. I know you're going to get a whooping. No, Did you no, cut no. your hair? Okay, go ahead. Did go you cut your hair? Go ahead. I'll cut your you hair. You me now. Okay. He never should have started talking. Not with Muhammad Ali. Oh, money. Clay, Clay. Did you Clay? I said Muhammad Ali. Clay? We, I will, you will call it when the fight comes on. Clay? Wait till the fight comes Clay? on. <laughs> Please tell everybody to get to your theaters. I've <laughs> never had a man that I wanted to whoop so bad. Ali in the red trunks has never been defeated in the ring. Bonavena, a rugged heavyweight, has been taking plenty of lefts and short right hands from Ali. But it's obvious Muhammad Ali's forced retirement has taken its toll. This is not the dancing master. This is a flat-footed Ali, lacking the speed, which was his hallmark. Bonavena, a tough professional. Muhammad Ali has had only one fight in the last four years, and that was against Jerry Quarry eight weeks ago. Two minutes and three seconds of the 15th round, Muhammad Ali had scored a knockout of Oscar Bonavena. Joe Frazier called the fight the dullest he'd ever seen. The stage was now set for Ali's dramatic showdown with smoking Joe Frazier. Madison Square Garden, March 8th, 1971. Each fighter received two and a half million dollars in boxing's richest payoff at the time. Ali was a hero among black Americans, and Frazier was identified as the white man's champion. This bout was the first of what would become one of the greatest rivalries this sport has ever seen. <laughs> That's what you do a man like Joe Frazier. <laughs> Back off of him, just keep boxing. There's nowhere in the world from a man that don't have no footwork to catch me. You do a welterweight. Just keep your camera moving, because I'm kind of fast. Keep your camera moving. He will be easy to hit. He will not be as much trouble or as awkward as Oscar Bonavino. Joe Frazier. I mean, this is the day, I'm man. About the day. Day. I just whooped You're not Bonavino. fighting Quarry. You're not fighting Oscar Bonavino. You're not fighting Sonny Listen. you fighting Joe Frazier. <laughs> Joe Frazier. If Joe Frazier whoops me, I'm getting on my hands on my knees. All across the ring. All across the ring. Look up to you, say, you. I'm going to tell you what. I don't know. You ain't going to be on the floor. I'm trying to get you on the spot if you think you're so good. Oh, 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 you power. Come on, man. Okay. And then I'm going to crawl back. I'm going to crawl back on both feet. Oh, my God. And then I'm going to well, and walk out the right. way and say, you better. Now, when well, I whoop you, the thing about it, see, you might don't be able to crawl. You won't be you. Ali trying to tie Joe Frazier up in close. Joe wants to punch in there. Ali tells Frazier that didn't hurt. Ali talking to Joe Frazier. The fans cheering for their man, Muhammad Ali, as Joe pours it on. Ali seems disdainful in there. Both men ripping, tearing, bombing punches at each other. This is what the crowd came to see. Ali tells Joe, come on back. And come back he does. Joe Frazier lands the best punch of the fight. Ali almost goes down. Ali in desperate trouble. Ali holding on. Frazier trying to end it here in round 11. And Ali lasts the round out. 
Frazier shoves Muhammad Ali off of him. It's all Joe Frazier. Another torrid left hook by champion Joe Frazier. Ali can hardly stand. and last round, it's still very close. An explosive left to the jaw and Muhammad Ali goes down. Ali is up at the count of three. Arthur Mercani wipes off the gloves and Joe Frazier moves in to finish it. Muhammad Ali had lost his first professional fight. Joe Frazier spent several days recuperating in a hospital. The right side of Ali's jaw was swollen to melon size. When they met in the center of the ring after the fight, Joe Frazier turned to Ali and said, we're not going to do any crawling. You fought one hell of a fight. Two years later on March 31st, 1973, Ali took on Ken Norton. George Foreman had in the meantime taken Joe Frazier's title with a dramatic two-round knockout. Muhammad Ali trained lightly for Norton, risking his chance for a shot at Foreman's crown. This is the 12th and final round. Ken Norton in blue, all over Muhammad Ali. Norton applying the pressure, sharp, crisp punches. Ali in desperate trouble here in the 12th and final round. Ali had suffered a major setback by losing a 12-round decision to Ken Norton. Muhammad's jaw may have been broken as early as the first round. After the fight, a doctor who examined the quarter of an inch separation said the pain must have been unbelievable. Muhammad Ali's boxing career was put in serious jeopardy. Grand Avenue here in Louisville, Kentucky. This was where Cassius Marcellus Clay grew up. And it was after a loss like that that he suffered in San Diego to Ken Norton that he still found support from family and friends. Friends who remember him training and doing road work by racing horses down the road at Churchill Downs. But Angelo Dundee, I have to ask you about that Ken Norton loss, the broken jaw that happened really early on and still the man went the distance and it's virtually unheard of. Well, I tell you, I tried, the first round he broke his jaw, uh, I noticed a different type of blood coming out of his mouth. You can tell it's a deep red type. And uh, in the second round, I, I told the kid, I said, hey, I may have to stop this fight. I think his jaw's busted. Uh, naturally, uh, he said, no, you ain't. He said, I, I can lick this sucker. I won't let him hit me. And uh, he went on. Every time a fighter who was supposed to win a fight does not win a fight, it harkens back to his training. And I guess that was really the case in this time around, too. Well, not really. I, I think Muhammad got to San Diego in pretty fair shape. And then they were hustling him around, bringing him to see this guy, this guy, you know. Uh, there was a, a promoter there that ran him all over the place, I, like he was running for mayor or running for an office, and didn't actually get the best shape. But there was no excuse for that. No cop out, no nothing. Uh, that, that far is a close fight. I don't know, if, know who won it actually, but it was a great lesson, him getting his jaw busted, because I told him to keep his mouth shut when he was working fighting in the ring, actually. At that point, I guess, that was really a time that Muhammad Ali could not afford two losses in a row. So the next fight with Norton, which was his next fight some six months later, he had to have. Well, actually, he was always better when he had something to prove. So he wanted to prove he was a better man than Ken Norton, that getting his jaw busted really detracted from his performance. He got in great shape. It was a great fight in L.A., and uh, he rectified what had happened in the first fight. So from Grand Avenue here in Louisville to Los Angeles, and a must fight, Muhammad Ali and Ken Norton, fight number two. September 10th, 1973, when Muhammad Ali went up against Ken Norton in the rematch, his boxing future was on the line. He trained harder than he had for any fight since beating Sonny Liston. Ali heard rumors Norton had said he was trash and approaching senility. Muhammad was upset, saying, now I have to punish him. 
Remember, Joe Frazier says that's the place to go to the body. Alley with a beautiful combination. Alley coming on strong. But how about Ken Norton? Fantastic display by both men. Two minutes to go. He's talking Alley again. A minute and 45 seconds to go. Ali captured a 12-round split decision, avenging his startling loss to Norton, and it set up the long-awaited rematch with Joe Frazier. January 28, 1974, Ali and Frazier met in Madison Square Garden three years after their first historic showdown, but this time there was no championship title on the line. Two warriors were locked in a battle for pride. Yeah, well, this is where a guy trying to keep himself alive. I could understand. I saw him the other day by looking at him. He's not the same guy. And uh, I hate to say this, but all the guys that went through the changes with me, they ain't the same guys after, you know what I mean? It takes an awful lot of, you know, uh, beating uh, in that round, in that fight. He take an awful lot of punch. You know, he's saying that the same thing. He's saying that he was the one who dealt out all, the, all of the punishment. <laughs> well, he must he was in the fight I was. <laughs> throwing bombs. Joe is hurt. Joe Frazier in trouble here in round two. Here referee Tony Perez unbelievably tells the fighters the round is over. There's confusion as both men go to their corners. Perez tells the men to continue. But was Joe Frazier saved from a knockout? Ali pouring it on here at the end of round two. This is the 12th and final round. Frazier looking for that knockout here in round 12. Joe is going all out. Ali lightning fast here in the 12th round. Pulling out all the stops here in the 12th round. And there's the end of this sensational fight. Ali won a hard-fought 12-round unanimous decision. Each fighter picked up $850,000. Hundreds of millions around the world saw the fight on closed circuit and anticipated Ali's challenge of heavyweight champion George Foreman. 4 a.m. in Kinshasa Zaire on October 30th, 1974. The world was his stage, and Muhammad Ali made the most of his rumble in the jungle with George Foreman. Ali went to the mountaintop one more time, and he pulled off one of the most miraculous upsets in heavyweight history. George Foreman will be meeting the world heavyweight champion. And then he will get a new feeling and a new fear that he's never had before, especially when he see the crowd. George Foreman is a dirty fighter. He is dirty. And I wouldn't, I mean, say dirty, I don't mean uh, morally. His style is dirty. When he fought Joe Frazier, I got the feeling Frazier's moving this way, he saw it, and deliberately hit him on the back of the head as he went away. I've never saw George Foreman tired yet. George Fulman lately haven't heard the man say, round four, round seven, round nine, round 13, last round. Then I want to see, I can't take nothing, George, but I haven't saw George in a good scuffle yet, get winded and throw all his load and have to come back and take a few jabs. Just never saw George constantly be blind to it's not hard, just second and moving. When I fought Sonny Liston, hitting power didn't mean nothing because usually I fix it when they can't find nothing to hit. So I never worry about hitting power. 
for a man like George that comes out with those big... <laughs> that's where he throw them, he draws them back. Hey, watch out, they come to the left. They come to the right. Get ready, they come to another left. That's what I hear when he's throwing them. So when a man, so I don't believe that I'm going to be knocked out and pushed around. I experience is why I know I'll win. George's furious attack of the early rounds was 90% gone. Muhammad Ali, unbelievably, is coming on strong here in the eighth. A ripping way to the end of the round sends Foreman crumbling like a tree struck by lightning. Millions sat in disbelief as Muhammad Ali sent Foreman reeling to the canvas. Ali had captured the heavyweight championship of the world for the second time. Both fighters earned $5 million for their efforts. A weary George Foreman could not remember the end of the fight as he asked his trainer Dick Sadler if he had been knocked out cold. Muhammad Ali was overcome with emotion, reaffirming his prophecies to the press before the fight. Just, I told you what I was going to do before I did it. I told you I was going to jab him in the corners. I was going to let him take all the shots. He was bewildered. Any heavyweight is bewildered who fights me. Frazier was, Martin was. Get your move. I told you this had no skill. I told you he don't hit hard. I told you it would be a total mismatch. Josh Fuller is still one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. <laughs> October 1st, 1975, the last historic confrontation between Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali, the largest closed circuit TV audience in history, was treated to one of the greatest fights in heavyweight history. People want to see me and Joe Frazier. They still think Joe Frazier can beat me. They don't want to see me and Ken Norton. They don't want to see me and George Foreman. They want to see me and Joe Frazier, although George Foreman annihilated Frazier, and George Fulman will beat Frazier every day in the week. George Fulman will beat Ken Norton every day in the week, and I will beat George Fulman every day in the week, right. but the fools still think that that chump Joe Frazier can beat me because he went the distance twice and he ended up on a close decision. I'm going to give him a real whooping, and I wrote a poem. Some of you heard it, but this is a little conscience. I got a little gorilla here. This is his conscience. I keep it right in my pocket everywhere I go. Right there. <laughs> and I wrote a short poem. It says it will be a killer and a thriller and a killer when I get the gorilla in Manila. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I got his conscience right here to keep me on guard. See, see, here's the way he looks when you hit it. <laughs> all night, that's all you can be. All night in Malaysia. That's all you're gonna see. The Philippines, rather. Come on, girl. We in Manila. <laughs> Come on, girl. This is a thriller. Torrid punches to the body and head by former champ Smoking Joe Frazier. Joe would love to regain the heavyweight crown. Here in the 14th round, it's still very close. A torrent of blistering punches staggers the former champion, Joe Frazier, in trouble here in the 14th round. Ali throwing bombs at Frazier. The champion is going for a knockout right here. Frazier's eyes were nearly shut after the 14th round, and his trainer Eddie Futch stopped the fight. 
the champion Muhammad Ali commented, it was like death, the closest thing to dying that I know of. Joe Frazier brings out the best in me and God bless him. It was a rivalry between two courageous athletes which will not soon be forgotten. Muhammad Ali Boulevard, testimony to the popularity of one of this city's favorite sons. On this street, the Louisville Gardens. That was the site of many of the closed circuit telecasts of Muhammad Ali, like the Thriller in Manila. And Angie, I guess it's safe to say that really might have been the champion's high point. Well, I'd have to say yes, because it was such a great night, a great fight. Uh, the fight going back and forth, Joe almost had my guy in the 11th round. The guy had to come suck it up and come back like he always done many, many times. Comes on and he wins it. It was a sensational fight. It, one of my most enjoyable moments with Muhammad. Muhammad, of course, was one of the great people at selling tickets to a fight, and he had to go out and sell that one just like the others. A little bit of animosity between he and Fraser, but when it was all over, he said Fraser was a great champion. No, Muhammad was a respecter of people. He respected Joe Fraser. He was selling something. If there was animosity, it was one-sided, and Joe Fraser will tell you that today also. We talk about the high points. I guess you got to look at the low points, too, and certainly the low point, perhaps, was the fight with Leon Spinks, the first fight. Very low. Felt like a midget that night. Nothing went right. Everything went wrong. Uh, Muhammad just couldn't get up for Spinks, and that was the whole key. Muhammad has to have something to shoot at. He had nothing to shoot at. A guy with seven fights, how's he going to beat Muhammad Ali? Well, it was going to be a walk in the park. As you mentioned, the guy was an Olympic champion, but he never fought the likes of Muhammad Ali. Ali only sparred two rounds every nine days. He started training at 242 pounds and finally came in at 224 pounds. But that takes a beating on a 36-year-old body. The results? were inevitable. February 15th, 1978. Ali had pondered retirement, but the thought of another payday against inexperienced Leon Spinks carried him into the ring. Ali weighed 242 when training camp opened, and he sparred only 50 rounds. It was evident that the world was watching their beloved Ali become an aging champion. Ali has been told by his trainer, Angelo Dundee, that he has to win this 15th round big if he is to keep his heavyweight title. Ali going right after Spinks, going all out in this 15th round. Ali at 224 pounds, Spinks 197 and a quarter, but Spinks is only 24 years old, and Ali is 36. Spinks battling right back against Ali. Ali looking to put him away here in this 15th round. Leon Spinks has had only seven professional fights. Ali gave away the early rounds, fooling around in the ring, playing rope-a-dope. Ali with a good combination, but Spinks battles right back. It's a very close fight. This round could decide the outcome. 30 seconds to go in the heavyweight championship of the world. Spinks against the ropes, but he's fighting off. Both men visibly tired. Ali throwing leather, a good left-right combination. Spinks again, battling right back with a good right hand. Ali now up against the ropes, the closing seconds. While his entourage cried out robbery and fix, Ali accepted the decision and announced, I lost the fight. Then in dramatic fashion, he echoed the words which became his trademark, I shall return. We have a split decision. It's a split decision. Now which way is it going to go? Flurry scores 143. 142, Ali. Ali gets the first vote. Good. Lutevich scores. 145, 140, Spink. Big margin, 130, 135. Buck scores. 144, 141, the new. Leon Spinks, six 
professional fight, defeat the great man of the ring, which now we've obviously seen the last of him. Watch your first word if you can. Oh, let him get to the microphone. Let him get to the microphone. We're all going to lose in life. You're going to lose your wife, you're going to lose your mother, you're going to lose your father. We all have losses in life. And one who can really overcome them losses and just keep living and try to come back or be successful. Can't go die because she lose. I did my best. And I trained, I was in shape. And so uh, just lost. When did you realize you were Was there a time when you knew you won it? No, it wasn't, no, it wasn't never a time. When you're in the ring, you never know when you're going to win or what. We're going to tell you all the truth. I'm his new manager. <laughs> Seven months later, on September 15, 1978, the stage was set for Ali to reclaim the heavyweight championship for the third time. He sparred over 200 rounds in training, saying, to win, all I need to do is suffer. There have been no knockdowns in this fight. Neither fighter has been really hurt. There are no cuts, and a great fight with less than a minute by Ali, but Strick's coming back. Going after the former champion. Probably Owen Payne. 30 seconds to go. And unless Leon Spink has got some superhuman effort in him, he kiss his crown goodbye. Well, good right hand by Spink. The old butterfly is stinging again. Well, Bobby, there it is, 11 seconds. 11 There'll be no knockout, that's for sure. There never was going to be one. Eight, seven. That is about it, folks. It's Ali. Ali is the world heavyweight champion for the third time, and here comes the Ali circle. Most of Joe Bat scores. Ten Ali, one Ivan, four Spink. Herman, du Herman Dutrex scores. 11 Ali. Fourth. Good. Honest Kojo scores. 10 Ali. 1 even. Fourth base. The new champion, Muhammad Ali. Ali collected three and a half million dollars from a gate of seven million the largest in boxing history. Muhammad Ali had accomplished what no man had ever done. He had won the heavyweight crown for the third time. This was his moment of glory. This was the miracle known as Muhammad Ali. But like Joe Lewis had before him, Muhammad Ali tried to go to the mountaintop once too often. October 2nd, 1980, the last hurrah for the people's champion as he took on former sparring partner Larry Holmes. Ali had lost 30 pounds in just six months by taking the drug Thyrolar to correct hypothyroidism. Muhammad Ali was a defenseless ex-champion on that fateful night. When Angelo Dundee cried out, that's it, it's over, to referee Richard Green, the world knew they had to look to boxing's future without Muhammad Ali. It is sad that when ex-champions overstay their welcome in the ring, we are left with only the illusions of grandeur. But when you look back at the dramatic life story of Muhammad Ali, think of his accomplishments in the ring. And think of his ability to capture the public limelight like no one before him. Many athletes have reached the pinnacle of success in their given sport. But only Muhammad Ali has transcended the athletic boundaries of boxing to become an international hero to millions of people all over the world. No question about it, the boxing world has a very large hole to fill. Angelo, I think the question will go on. I don't know if it can ever be answered as to when Muhammad should have quit, when was the right time. A lot of people said after the third Fraser fight that that was the end for both men, that it was such a punishing fight. Well, I don't take it that way. I think Muhammad had plenty left to offer. I mean, Muhammad, you must realize at no time was happy outside of the ring. I mean, without being around guys like yourself, 
pointing the mic at him, television cameras, radio. He was not a happy guy. I mean, even meeting heads of state, he didn't have the same impact being in the fight, a range thing, before fight, after fight, pre-fight, putting the guys on. This was his love. He loved it. And right up until the last minute, he loved every minute of it. Once again, a subjective question. In the great scheme of things, you've been around this sport a long time. Where do you put Muhammad Ali amongst the great heavyweight champions? I, I got to put him at the top because he was so great in the ring and out of the ring. He's got to be a guy that changed the whole innovation of boxing. He was the guy that said, "My, I do the talking. I'm the star. Nobody else talks for me. That was Muhammad Ali. He changed the innovation from the Joe Louis era, where Joe Louis says, my man will do the talking, I'll do my fighting in the ring. Well, Muhammad did a great job of fighting out of the ring and in the ring. He was dynamite with, in every phase. The greatest of his time or the greatest of all time? It's a question that will go on. will be talked about in boxing circles as long as there is a heavyweight championship up for grabs. Until next time, then, for Angelo Dundee, I'm Barry Tompkins, and we'll see you on Boxing's Best. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.